man, are we fired up to be at midweek tonight? I don't know, I don't know. Are we ready to get in the Word of God tonight? Well, I have some good news. We've made it through first principles. All the way from seeking God to now the Word study. And now the church study. And uh, next week, amen, count of the cost. I'm just kidding. Tonight's the final night of first principles. We've gone from seeking all the way to now the church study. I pray you're encouraged. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, mighty God, we come before you with gratitude in our hearts, with eager anticipation to see what your scriptures are going to speak to us. For we know every time your word is open, there's an opportunity for us to hear your word individually as your disciples and collectively as your people, spiritual Israel. God, we ask that you allow us to take whatever's in our hearts right now and to not just throw it outside so we walk outside right after the lesson and, and forget about the lesson and we go pick it back up. But help us cast our burdens upon to you. Cast our fears, our anxieties, compartmentalize our sin and confess it right after this lesson, God. And let us make a decision to just like as when we were young Christians to hear the word of God and let it penetrate our very hearts. Father God, mighty King Elohim, we come before you with gratitude, excitement, and awe. Speak to us tonight. Put a fire in our soul. In the name of Jesus Christ, we want to study about your church. Amen. Amen. Tonight, we're going to talk about the church study. Let's begin in Colossians chapter 1. Let's get right into it. Colossians 1. Make sure we're clicking or flipping over there, guys. Amen. Omar was clicking a little slow, I'm just saying. Colossians 1. Verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. Woo! What a powerful passage. The Bible teaches, the Holy Scriptures, the Word of Life, teaches that Jesus, the Son, is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is God's. If you don't believe that, write it down and get a deep conviction on it. That's what the Bible teaches. And the Bible teaches, in him all things were made. They were created through him and for him. This hotel or this uh, facility was not made for people to bowl downstairs. This facility was made for Jesus' body, the church, to have midweek in. That one's free for you, amen? And here's what I love. It says, all things were created by him and for him, and in him all things hold together. What is all things? From the moment you have your very first breath and your heart beats to the last breath you have, God keeps your heart beating every second for all of the duration of your life. Right now, the earth is spinning over a thousand miles per hour and God put gravity there to hold us in place what is keeping our hearts beating what is keeping the earth in place the Bible says God holds all things together so if God can keep the earth in motion gravity in place and your heart beating for your entire life some of us are so stressed that God can't keep your life together but let me take some anxiety from you tonight. If God can keep the universe in motion, God can keep your life together 
as well. So if your life feels in disarray and out of order, what's the point? You're not at this moment close to Jesus. But once we get close to Jesus again, what's going to happen? Order is going to be restored. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. And the Bible says that he who holds all things together is the head of the body, the church. So now we understand an incredible picture here. Jesus is the head. The church is the body. Isn't that amazing? Jesus is the what? The church is the body. Now, can a body function without a head? Can a head function without a body? Therefore, the church is essential to Christianity. There's some that say, church, no. Jesus, yes. But we see how impossible of a statement that actually is. For it is impossible to be connected to the head if you are not first connected to the body. It's like my hand walking around and saying, hey, uh, I'm, I'm part of Jason. I am Jason. But it's no longer connected. What a weird, I mean, you're like, what's the um, Adam's family, is it? What's the hand called? You're like the thing walking around. Don't be a thing, be the body. Some people say, you know, I just don't think this church is really for me. Me and Jesus are going to figure it out. But the moment you disconnect from his body, you disconnect from him. And some people say, yeah, you can disconnect from disciples. And, you know, we can't judge their followaways. That's foolishness. When someone disconnects from sold out disciples of Jesus, they will not remain faithful to Christ. What do we understand here? We need the body. We need each other. We need the church. And that's why when we gather together, we call it meetings of the body. Isn't that amazing? So this is quite interesting. Jesus is not physically here on earth, okay? He's physically, believe it or not, Jesus physically resurrected and his body is physically in heaven. And one day, 1 Corinthians 15, all of us are going to have a physical resurrection and a physical bodies in heaven with Jesus, with his physical body. That's pretty awesome right there. That one's free. I'm studying out heaven. We can get into all eschatology theories later. But we need to understand here, Jesus is not physically here with us right now, but he is. Because we're his body. He's the head. Where two, more than get, where two or more are gathered, there I am. Doesn't that make more sense now? Where two more disciples are gathered, guys, or as we say in Texas, y'all. We are Jesus collectively. Therefore, when people come together, what are they coming to see? They're not coming to see the city of angels or a church or a group or a fellowship. They, when we come together, people see Jesus Christ in this room tonight. That's pretty awesome right there. Now, the church is the body, but it's also the family of God. Look in Ephesians chapter 2 very quickly. So do we have a conviction now? You, you can't walk away from the body and still be in Christ. As well with the family. Ephesians 2. The Bible says in verse 19, Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Let's pause there. We're no longer foreigners and strangers as disciples. We're not American disciples. Or maybe some of you are, are Nigerian disciples or uh, Chinese disciples or British disciples. No, there's no such thing as a national disciple. When you are baptized into Christ, you're part of God's nation, God's family, God's kingdom, God's country. So who's the head of God's households? 
the head of God's household. Well, God, right? Jesus, okay. Uh, so God the Father is the head. So, okay, I become a disciple. What does that make me to God? I'm a son of God. Isn't that pretty awesome there? Okay, there was a point in time when Nate became a disciple. So when Nathaniel became a disciple, what did that make him to God? So we have this equation that we all like to use in the study. So, okay, God's a father, right? Nate's a son. I'm a son. What does that make us? You guys with me there? God's the father. Imagine a triangle. God's the father. Nate's a son. I'm a son. At the bottom of the triangle, we are brothers. That's right, bro. Come on, brother. I didn't get to choose my sister growing up. God chose her for me. Yes. I didn't get to choose Nate's. But he stuck with me <laughs> because we are brothers. Therefore, regardless of how we feel about each other on a certain day, we are blood brothers in Christ for the rest of our lives. But family members may say, blood is thicker than water. The church is water. Our family's blood. We say, no, it's Christ's blood that's far thicker than family blood. So the church is the body of Christ, but the church is the family of Christ. Isn't that amazing? Amazing, Many of us had different experiences with family members growing up. Some of us have great experience when it comes to family. Some of us negative experience when it comes to family. Let me put this before you. It doesn't matter what our experiences were, no matter how great, how challenging, God has brought us to his true family to learn his definition of family in his kingdom and his family collective together. Now here's the question. We're the body, we're the family, but how do we enter it? Look over in 1 Corinthians 12. How do you become a part of the church, the body? Do you sign a membership card? Uh, That's not what I did. Do you start giving money and then you're part of it? Do you have to like fill some link out online and then you're a member? First Corinthians 12, verse 12. Just as a body, though one is many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit as to form one body. Woo -hoo -hoo. How do we enter the body? We're baptized. So the moment you were baptized into Christ for your study, and the moment you will be baptized into Christ, you enter Christ's body. Let's get a little deeper insight. Look in Romans 6. This scripture will mean a little more to you now. Romans 6, Preach. verse 3. Preach. The Bible says in Romans 6, verse 3. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized in his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised through the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Wow. So we're baptized in the body. We live in 1 Corinthians 12. But in Romans 6, 3, and 4, we're baptized into whose body? Christ. So by faith in the waters of baptism, you come in contact with the body and blood of Jesus. By faith, you meet the body of Jesus in the waters of baptism. So you meet Jesus in the waters of baptism. Then when you pop out of the waters of baptism, you pop into the body of Christ. You pop into the family of God. And now together as baptized, sold out disciples, we are Christ's body. We are Christ's family. Now look back in Ephesians. Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, we'll pick it up in verse 20. Of course, we learned about God's household, but verse 20, what is it built on? Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So what is the church built on? The foundation of what? The apostles and the prophets with Christ as the chief cornerstone. Now, uh, what's a cornerstone? It's an architectural term. And it's the first stone that was laid down when a building was being built. 
And if the corner, if the cornerstone was the perfect stone, and if the cornerstone was off an inch, what would happen to the house? The house would be drastically off. If the cornerstone wasn't perfect, the house would be far, far, far from perfect. Jesus Christ is totally perfect. So the church is built on Jesus Christ as our cornerstone and the apostles and prophets. Where do we find the prophets? In the Old or New Testament? Where do we find the apostles? In the Old or New Testament? Wow. In John chapter 1, verse 1 through 2 and verse 14, Jesus is the word of God. Old Testament and New Testament. What is the word of God built on? What's our foundation? The very word of God, the Bible. Not a human creed, not a doctrine, not a booklet, not a man, not a website. What is our church based on? The very word of God. What's the brains of our operation? What's our decisions for how we're going to act? What's our convictions for how we're going to live? What's the direction we are going to go? We are simply going to follow the Bible. We are simply going to follow the Word of God. The church is built on the Bible. Now, that's a good question. We need to ask our generation. As there's over 45,000 different denominations today. So if there's one Jesus, how many bodies should there be if there's 45,000 denominations? You know, we read in 1 Corinthians 12, we're baptized into how many bodies? Look over in Romans chapter 12. So 1 Corinthians 12, one body. Let's see if Romans 12 says the same thing. Romans 12. We'll pick it up in verse 4. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, though many form how many bodies? One body. Each of us belongs to the other. So let's get rid of that garbage where this is my business and that's your business. We belong to each other. My business is your business, and your business is my business. But I just want to sprinkle that one in here right now. Don't get defensive in the kingdom of God when it comes to this life. I just want to sprinkle that one over there. Okay. But how many bodies are there according to this passage? One body. So Ephesians, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, how many bodies? One. Romans 12, how many bodies? One. Look over to Ephesians 6. I just want to make sure this is true throughout all the scriptures. Romans chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, there's one body. Oh, my goodness, let's just stop there. How many bodies? <laughs> there's one body. You know, there's, there's only one church of sold out disciples for every city in the first century. We had the church in Rome. That was it, the Roman church. It wasn't, you know, the 7th Street, 8th Street, 9th Street, 10th Street church. It was the church, the disciples. The family, the way, the truth, God's life in Rome. The church in Corinth. The church in Galatia. The church in Ephesus. God's plan was one church in the first century. And God's plan is still for us to compose one church in the 21st century. Therefore, we need to look around at 45,000 different denominations. Over 450 in America alone, but 45,000 around the world. Why is there so much division throughout the last 2,000 years of Christian history? Simply put the word division. Say division. division. Now, division can be satanic and of the devil. But division can also be of God. Let's look at both. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians 1. Paul writes to the church in Corinth in 55 AD. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another and what you say and that there be no divisions among you, but you be perfectly united in mind and thoughts. My brothers and sisters, 
Some from Chloe's household inform me there are quarrels among you. You know, let's pause right there. We can't be afraid to tell on a brother and sister when they're in spiritual help. <laughs> Chloe's household blew the whistle. You can't be afraid to let people know if there's something wrong in your ministry. You got to open your mouth so they can get the spiritual help that they need. You got to be courageous. You got to take a stand and say what's going on. What I mean is this. One of you say, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollo. Some other, I follow Cephas. That's Peter. Some other, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? What's the answer? No. It's rhetorical. No. You're baptized into Christ. You know, there were divisions. Some were saying, man, I'm just so fired up for Paul-style leadership. I'm so fired up for Peter-style leadership. I'm so fired up for Apollos. When is division bad? When people follow doctrines, teachings, and ministry styles of men over their convictions and simply following the word of God. And now they're following men and they're dividing with their groups. And that's why we have so many denominations today. What is a denomination? It means the name of a group. Think about it. Denom a nation. D is of Latin origin, it means of. Nom is of Latin origin, it means name. And Asian, English origin, it means group. Literally, a denomination, you're not of Christ, you're of a group. So Lutheranism, the Lutherans, they're of the group of Martin Luther. The Methodists, they're of the group of John and Charles Wesley. Presbyterianism, they're of the group of John Calvin and John Knox. Mormonism, they're of the group of Joseph Smith with all his witchcraft. The Catholic Church, they're following the teachings and the traditions and the popes throughout all the ages. Division is satanic when people are basing their decisions on men and personalities over the word of God. But when is division of God. Look over in Luke chapter 12. Luke 12. Keep in mind the letters are read here. That means Jesus is talking. Luke 12, 51. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? I tell you no, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other. Three against two, two against three. They will be divided. Father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. When is division of God? Come on, bro. When a man or woman takes a righteous stand for the truth and simply says, this is what the Bible says. And someone else does not want to do that anymore. Oops. What is going to take place? A godly division. So we literally see this in the family units. When someone becomes a disciple at times, their family divides from them. It says there will be five against two and all these different numbers. What happens when you become a disciple? Often your family divides from you. But if you persevere in time, and we've seen this time and time again, siblings and parents become disciples because you took a stance and were willing to have godly division. See, if people are not willing to take godly division, no one will ever truly know what the truth is if a man is not willing to take a righteous stand for truth. Therefore, what is our church built on? What is, what, what is our anthem? What is our national anthem? What is our hope? What is our foundation? What, what directs us in every single step we are going to take as God's people? The word of God. Not a man, not an organization, not an idea, not a theory, not a pamphlet, not a booklet. Simply the word of God. Yeah. Why is that our anthem? Because that was the anthem of the first century church. Yeah, come on, bro. Preach. The first century church was marvelous. The apostles were trained by Jesus for three years. And of course, we have bring your neighbor days, don't we? Oh, yeah. 
We like bring your neighbor days. But in Acts chapter 2, God called for a bring your nation day. (laughs) Commentators say there were well over 100,000 people in Palestine on the day of Pentecost. Thousands and thousands, scores of individuals heard Peter preach that you crucified Jesus Christ. He preached biblical conversion. And in one day, three thousand souls were saved. Isn't that powerful? They were inspired. They were zealous. There was no church buildings in those days. There was no popes and priests and clergy. They weren't very organized. But they were so fired up to follow the words of Jesus to go and make disciples. And they were extremely persecuted for the cause. You've heard me speak a lot about persecution, but they were beat, they were whipped, they were stoned, they were murdered, they were treated terribly. As I shared, Nero literally put them on stakes in his garden, lit them on fire and said, you're no longer the light of the world, you are the light of my garden. This was the life that the Bible teaches in Revelation chapter 12. They did not love their life so much as to shrink back from death. What did it mean to be a faithful disciple in the first century? You were willing to die to be martyred for your faith. Wow. Isn't that something? Yeah, yes. something. So we, we, we claim our roots are in the restoration movements. Right. We want to restore back to what? The first century church. Yeah. Let's very quickly understand what restoration is. If I borrow Ryan Caceres' car and I crash it, and I take it to the auto shop, and it's like, uh, what, what type of car do you have, brother? What do you got? What type of car you got? What, what color? He's got a black Corolla. I take it to uh, Nathaniel's auto shop in Compton. And they pimp his rides. They put a pink spoiler on there. They put spinners. They do all sorts of stuff. And I bring it back to Brother Ryan and say, Brother, I reformed your car. What you think? He's going to say, this is foolish. Take it back. Get it fixed. I want it restored. So to get it restored, what, what, what brand again? I take it back, the Corolla, back to the Toyota dealer. And I say, please restore this back to the Corolla in her former glory as she should actually be. Make it identical out of the box, out of the factory, true Toyota car for our dear brother, Ryan. Okay. That's the difference between reformation and restoration. Our roots are in the restoration movement. It's like if I break my finger, I have reformed it. Then they put it in a cast, they crack it back, it's being restored. So our goal is to look back, not to the second, not the third, not the fourth, not the fifth, not even the 20th century. Our goal is to look back to the first century and say, that's our ideal. That's our goal. That's our ambition. We want to restore the book of Acts, restore the first century church in our generation. So as we talk through church history, we see many people that fought to restore, but often they only reformed and they tried to go back to the first century, but so often they fell short. You know, persecution continued throughout the ages. It got bad throughout the ages, but in time, in 312 AD, there was what's known as the Battle of Malvin Bridge with Constantine. Now, Emperor Constantine had a dream. He had a dream that if he puts the first two letters in Greek, the Greek name for Christ is Christos. Starts with a chi, it's like an X sign, and a row, uh, it's like a P sign, but it makes an R sound. And he said, if I put those letters together, the X with a line through it, the P on top, you're going to win the battle. That was his dream. He put those, that sign in his battle. Guess what happened? Uh, on, on his, the, uh, he put that sign on the shields of his men, and guess what happened? They won the battle. So he became a Christian in his minds. So by 313, he produces the Edict of Milan, which legalizes Christianity. And that paves the way for, in time, Christianity to become the state religion of the Roman Empire. Why is that so bad? 
The persecuted church went to the privileged church. From only a handful of people were true Christians, sold out disciples, willing to die for their faith. Now the prostitute sleeping with that guy, the drunkard and the guy doing drugs, they're all equal Christians. The pagans, they're Christians. The priest and the pag pagans are Christians. Everyone's a Christian. What did that do to the level of commitment in the church? It dropped it instantly. It was done. It was gone. The church was destroyed as compared to its former glory. They reformed it in a very negative fashion. They would walk into pagan temples, pull out many of the pagan practices, yet keep some of them. For instance, pagans like to worship women and multiple gods like Aphrodite. So they worshiped Mother Mary. Wow. Worshiping Mary was a Catholic tradition. The prayer beads, that was a Catholic tradition. And many other things like celibate priest when Paul literally says in time, Satanic doctrines will emerge, commanding men not to marry. Paul literally prophesied this satanic division that would take place. So they would pull out the pagan practices. They put a cross on top, and they mixed the paganism with Christianity. What is Catholicism? It's Greco-Roman paganism with the crucifix. Three sixty four. There's a split in the Roman Empire. Therefore, there's a split in Christianity. Of course, Eastern Orthodox had celibate. Uh, excuse me. Had priests that would marry. Roman Catholics had celibate priests. Is that a good division or a bad division? Ten fifty four. The Great Schism. They excommunicate each other. Is that a good division or a bad division? 1095 was Satan's trump card. Of course, Jesus called them to take the world for Christ. But we understand Pope Urban II commanded the Catholic army to pick up their swords and fight. He began the crusades, the seven major crusades, and slaughtered Muslims and Jews at wholesale. 1300s, you had the beginning of the Reformation movement. 1320, John Wycliffe, he printed the Bible in English for the first time. He gave the people back the word of God so they could understand it. He gave them the Bible, a version they could read for themselves. He put the power back in the hands of the people. So many go to church, so many study the Bible, and they believe it's only the church that can interpret it for them. That was never God's plan. God's plan is for us to put the truth back in the hands of the people to make Bereans of our generation. You know, John Wycliffe, was known as the morning star of the Reformation. 33 years after his death, they found him guilty of heresy. His Bible was illegal. 34 years after his death, they exhumed his body from the grave and burned him at the stake. That's how much the Catholics hated John Wycliffe. In the 1500s, Martin Luther, of course, 15, uh, 1483 to 1546 AD, and we understand he came up with the 95 Theses. He was a monk working for the Catholic Church. And as he's studying all these old scrolls, he's reading them and realizes, we've drifted so far. He opened the Bible. He said, here's the traditions. Here's the Bible. We've drifted so far. This is the church. This is the Bible. Open the door. Where's the people? This isn't God's plan. And he writes 95 things down, nails into the church in Wittenberg, and now he needs to run for his life. They call that day when he nailed that 95 Theses the birthday of the Reformation. Now Martin Luther continued his Reformation. There were many other men that took stands like John Calvin in 1509 to 1564. And of course, in 1527, you had the Anabaptist movement that began. They took a stand against Protestant and Catholics and said, hey, if you want to be saved, you need to be born again. Now, how would the Catholics persecute them when they found them? They would say, oh, you need to be born again in, in water? Let's drown you again in water. And they would take their lives through drowning. In 1534, you have the Church of England emerges in a great way as you have Pope Clement VII refused to grant King, grant King Henry VIII an annulment of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon to get Mary Anne Boleyn. Of course, that becomes the Church of England. So Jesus is supposed to be the head. Thank you so much, my brother. Jesus is the head of the church. Now you have the Pope is the head of the church. 
But a king that wants to sleep with another woman, now because the Pope won't allow him to, he makes himself the head of the church. And now you have the Episcopalian church. So when you see the Episcopalian church in America, what is that? It's just a king who wanted more sex. So we understand from this era, from the 1500s, the 1600s, and we're going to see the 1700s, there you get almost every modern denomination that we have today in the 21st century. 1700s, of course, the Great Awakening Movement, John Charles Wesley. They divide over the Church of England, over having a personal transforming decision for Christ, not a state religion. High accountability for all believers, and they preach to the unchurched, but they still baptize infants just like Luther and just like Calvin. Is that a good division or bad division? Well, it's somewhat good. They tried to return, but did they make a full return? You guys got to understand this. 2,000 years of history. Men had been so lost. They started to return, but then they stopped before they get back to the first century. They stop before they get totally committed. They stop before they restore true doctrine. They stop before they totally restore the life that God expects. 1830s, you have the doctrine of praying Jesus in your heart. Jesus at the door. He's knocking. Let him in. 1886, the student volunteer movement with Moody where students begin to go on campus. And of course, 1951, you have Campus Crusades for Christ begins at UCLA and they really begin to spread pray Jesus in your heart all over the campuses. 1900, 1906, you have the Pentecostal movements. In 1906, you have the Azusa Street Pentecostal movement. Why? Because Christianity was so boring, dry, and stale. People wanted something more exciting and that gave birth to Pentecostalism mysticism. 1800s, now you have what's known as the Restoration Movements. These guys woke up John uh, Alexander Campbell, Thomas Campbell, his father, and Barton Stone formed the Restoration Movement. I've read all four of their major history books, and I don't recommend them. They're as dry as cardboard. <laughs> but I can share with you what they're about. The restoration movements. And these men took radical stands. They said, we don't want a creed. We don't want to be a part of a group that teaches some random stuff. We want to simply be Christians only according to the word of God. That's it. Okay. They say to be saved, you got to believe the word, hear the word, repent, confess, and be baptized for the forgiveness and remission of your sins. They taught you actually need to be disciples. But they had a lot of divisions within the groups. For instance, the Catholic Church was very unified. The one thing the Catholic Church did great is their unity. They were unified under a false man called the Pope. But in fear, the, the Restoration Movement, the Church of Christ, they had three major divisions, Ryan can go into all of them, but the Church of Christ, the conservative Christian church and the disciples of Christ. Okay, we're not going to get into all those for the sake of time. But they had a lot of divisions within there. Uh, why? Because they were autonomous. The Catholic church was a unified body. The church of Christ was autonomous. Each one had their own government, their own governance. They all did their own thing. So you have many churches that believe different things. Some said, hey, in the Bible, uh, Jesus only had one cup that he passed around for communion. Therefore, if you have more than one cup, you're in sin. They would say, hey, in the Bible, one group would say, uh, there's no kitchens in the church. So uh, if you have a kitchen in the church, you're, you're going to hell. But there's no bathrooms in the church and you have bathrooms in your church. Others would say, hey, if you have a piano in in the New Testament, uh, even though, you know, the book of Psalms literally means songs play the string instrument, and there's instruments in heaven in Revelation, but they say there's none in the book of Acts, therefore you're going to hell if you have a piano in the church. You literally have guys in, in, in the search for the ancient order, their history books, break into churches and smash pianos. Yeah. Yeah. That's the amount of division they had, of course. 1830, uh, Joseph Smith breaks away from the from the restoration movement over new revelations, although he practiced witchcraft, so please don't ever trust Joseph Smith with his never, polygamy. Never, never. Amen. Now, we need to understand here, the Church of Christ did a lot of good things. They restored biblical doctrine. But the Bible says in 1 Timothy 4.16, watch your life and your doctrine. 
they fail to watch their lives closely. If someone restores true doctrine, but the life of the church falls short, falling short of a return to the scriptures. So, for instance, in 1967, the Mainline Church of Christ begins in reaction to 1951 Bill Bright's Campus Crusade for Christ, they begin what's known as Campus Advance. And they put Church of Christ kids on campus, say, let's go evangelize. And they were fired up. That's where Kip was baptized. They were fired up. They started baptizing all these students. Kip went to Eastern Illinois University, and in three years, starting with only seven students, had 300 baptisms. That's how fired up the students were. Isn't that powerful? But you bring all those students to the Church of Christ. And what would happen? You would have many of them not came to midweek. You have the older people smoking cigarettes during the fellowship break. There was two churches. There was two camps within the church. There was two movements within the movements. And you had different levels of commitments. So what happened? The Bible says you can't pour new wine to old wine skins. Why did Jesus say that? When wine is, is fermenting, it literally boils, it bubbles. And if you have bubbling wine and old wine skins, the wine skins expand as you put wine in them. So if the wine skins already expanded, when they try to expand again, they're going to pop. So you had all these young, fired up Compton students expanding their faith, expanding their vision. And you put them in the old wine skins of the church of Christ, many churches split because they were lukewarm. So in 1979, Kip has an opportunity to go to Lexington, Massachusetts. And he says, I'll only come on one condition. If I can call the whole church to be committed. They say, no, Kip, you can't do that. We'll lose half the church. He says, that's the only way I'll come. Sorry. Months later, he called, they call him again. Please, Kip, we need you. The whole church. He says, sorry, Kip, we can't do that. The church is 70 people. We'll lose half the membership. Months later, they call him again. He says, you know what I'm going to say, all committed. They say, okay, Kip, fine, come and do it. The first midweek, he draws a line down the center of the room, and there is formed the 30 would-be disciples. So the church more than shrunk in half. But guess what happened? They hadn't had a baptism in years. And in the first year, they had over 100 baptisms. Wow. Second year, 200. Third year, over 300. By the fourth year, they had over daily baptisms for every single day of the year. Wow. That's what happens, church. When you take a group of totally sold-out disciples with a sold-out life, a sold-out doctrine, what's going to happen? It's going to radically multiply for the glory of God. Some of you up here are like, why is he shouting every week? Why is he up here so intense? Because I believe this. I believe if I can convince you to get sold out. If I can get the Latin ministry, the marriage ministry, the campus, the teens and the singles. If I can get everyone sold out for the glory of God. Then and only then can we be God's multiplying church. You know, Kip began, and they expanded. They went from one church in one nation to over 400 churches and 170 nations with over 135,000 disciples. Can you say change the world? There was a 2020 episode on them on the news. You know, sadly, division arose within the leadership of the International Churches of Christ. And it began as a doctrinal drift. Kip was taken on a leadership, he took a sabbatical. And at that point, all of the kingdom teachers began to speak up. The kingdom teachers were men who had a mainline Church of Christ background, mainline Church of Christ theology background. And they believed in a mainline Church of Christ theology where the church was lukewarm. So they instantly look around the Church of Christ and say, hey, there's no lead evangelist in the Bible. Therefore, a lead evangelist is sin. Let's put the elders in charge again. There's no Bible talks in the Bible, therefore Bible talks are sin. There's no discipling in the Bible, discipling relationships, the word discipling relationships used, therefore discipling relationships are sin. Overnight, you had churches come up and the preachers would say, discipling's done, 
Bible talks are done. Commitment's done. See you guys next Sunday. All right, see you around. What? That's scary. Bro, what? Imagine what that would do to your heart. Bro. People committed. They've given up everything for this. People that went to other nations, sold everything they had, gave them their lives, their careers, their schools, everything. They put it all on the line. They were radical. And overnight, because of the doctrinal drift, the movement divided, fractured, split, and crashed. Now, it began as a doctrinal drift, but what happened in time, it became a life drift. When doctrine goes, the lives follow. And in time, all the churches became lukewarm, and the ICOC has done nothing but shrink for the last over 20 years. 2007, praise God. The City of Angels Church was founded. Tick took a stand once again and said we need to form a group of like-minded individuals who are totally sold out for the glory of God. And we have seen God do such great things because of that stance. Literally churches all over the world. Come on, bro. And every one of us is here. Because they've kept radical stance in 2007 to call for a sold out church composed of only sold out disciples. You see, that's the message, church. That's the message for you and I that we need to hear tonight. Throughout history, there's been a fight to get back to the first century. There's been a fight to get back to the book of Acts. But so often people fall short. But you need to realize, church history did not end in Acts 28. And church history is not over tonight. But it's up to you and I to imitate the revolutionary spirit of our dear brother Kip. It's up to you and I to imitate the revolutionary spirit of the apostles. It's up to you and I to imitate the revolutionary spirit of Jesus Christ. And to always be willing to take a stand for the word of God. Therefore, the question we need to ask ourselves, what is the one church? Ooh. What is the one church? Are we, is the ICC the one church? Is the City of Angels the one church? Is the Church of Christ the one church? Look over in Acts 11. The answer is yes and no. Acts chapter 11. This is pivotal. Let's stay locked in. Acts 11, verse 25. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and saw great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians. First in Antioch. So a disciple equals a Christian, Christian equals someone who's Saved. equals someone who's part of the church. Then what is the one church? It's any true sold out disciple of Jesus. Whoa. So if you drop a Bible on an island and a couple individuals read it and they baptize each other and they get fired up and they're sold out disciples, they're not following a creed, they're not following a man, they're not following an organization, they're following the word of God. Those are our brothers and sisters on the island. They're part of the one church. So is the city of angels the one church? Yes and no. Let me tell you, the organization is there to guide the truth. Uh, uh, Excuse me. The truth is there to guide the organization. And the organization is there to strengthen the truth. What happened in the first century church, you had the truth guided the organization of the church. The Catholics, what happened? The organization guided which way the truth would go. So for us, what is the one church? The one church is you and me. The one church is disciples. And praise God, we have a movement. Praise God, we have the city of angels. Praise God, we have these structural foundations to help us keep the truth intact. But what is the one church? The one church is not the name of a church. The one church is not the International Christian Churches or the Church of Christ or the city of angels. The just every single soul out disciple. That's what we need to have a strong conviction on. 
And the call for us is to take a stand on the word of God. And to always, always, always fight to restore our convictions, our church, our Bible talks, and our ministries back to the first century church. Let's close in Matthew 28. What does our church stand on? Three things I want to close on. Matthew 28, verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and sure I'll with you always the very end of the age. Three things the church stands for. Number one, every member must be a true, sold-out disciple of Christ. That's it, guys. If, if a ministry is lukewarm and does not have sold out disciples, that's no longer the one church. Come on, Jason. Come on, Jason. The one church is sold out disciples. And we must have an unapologetic message from the pulpits, from our Bible talk, and a loving but unapologetic message in D times that every member must be a soul. It is not an option. If you don't want to be a soul disciple, go to the Church of Christ. Go to the ICOC. Go to the Conservative Church. But if you want to be a sold out disciple, then you can stay with us. Number two, all nations. To be a part of God's church, we must be willing to do anything, give up everything, and go anywhere to reach every nation in our generation. Our clarion call is to see the evangelizations of every nation. You need to be willing to go to the Middle East and be martyred for your faith. You need to be willing to go to Japan and learn Japanese. You need to be willing to go to Africa and, and go explore all these sorts of lands you've never seen before and go evangelize all the countries in Africa. You need to be willing to go to any state, any city, any country, any continent for the glory of God. And number three, teaching them to obey. Right. What is the true church? What does the church look like? What is the body of Christ? Every member is involved in true first century discipling. And imitating Jesus as a rabbi and disciple, the Greek word mate taste, where you are imitating the in them. And you as a discipler are dedicating your entire life to forming Christ in this individual. And what's going to happen? When we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of disciples in Los Angeles yes. forming Christ in one another, fighting to become true, fiery revolutionaries, yes. carrying that fire of Christ. Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, I have a baptism to undergo and how I wish it were already here. And let me tell you, there's a fire and how I wish it were kindled. And that fire is living inside every single disciple of Christ tonight. But imagine every single disciple taking that fire and spreading it to other disciples and other disciples and making more disciples. Then without a doubt, we together from this room alone could reach every single nation in our generation. And that, my brothers and sisters, is the true church of Christ. Amen.